Amen. Good to see everyone here today. Happy St. Patty's Day, I guess. For those of you wearing green, good on you. I forgot I didn't, so don't pinch me, please. But uh, <coughs> praise God. We're going to finish our conclusion today uh, of, our, of, of the messages that we've been talking about is wait and see. It's talking about that time period when, you know, God's put something in your heart. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a promise. Maybe it's something that you're standing and believing for, whatever the case may be. It's that period of time from when it, you've got that dream, when you've got that promise, until, after, until it actually happens, that waiting period, waiting on God, waiting to see what's going to happen, what can I do next. <clears throat> so we're going to recap a little bit about last week, what we learned, in case you missed that one, and then we'll get into today's message. But let's open our hearts. I know you guys are all ready to receive. That was awesome worship. I could feel you guys worshiping him, but let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to come together in our freedom to worship you, to praise you, to hear your word. And God, we open our hearts, we open our minds, our ears, just to listen and to receive from you today. God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would nudge us in those places that we need to make an adjustment. So that most of all, God, during the time of waiting, that our hearts are like your heart. That you would transform us. That we would have the right attitude, the right spirit, the right mindset, the right heart. That we would have a heart after you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we talked about waiting well. How does it, what does it look like to wait well during that pause se season? Waiting well looks forward to the future, but you're still staying present in the present. Waiting well means that I'm open to God and allow him to move in me towards that future in his time. That we be patient, that we be long-suffering during that time. Staying present meant that well, I'm happy for others when I see their dream come true, even though maybe it's breaking my heart that my heart or that my dream hasn't come true. It's accepting the questions that are unanswered. God, why is it taking so long? What, what am I doing wrong? God, what's, what's the deal here? Waiting well means being content with the here and now while you're looking towards that future. You know, and all of God's, all of our wait and see moments happen in God's perfect timing. Our timing would be yesterday, wouldn't it? We want it now. You know, maybe in your wait and see, it could be anything. It could be a financial need. It could be a marital uh, need, maybe a relationship that you're waiting on that spouse or you're waiting on that um, person to get their act together so that it can be a happy marriage. Maybe it's a, a, your wait and see, a, a return of a wayward loved one. Or maybe it's in a job situation, like Pastor Rich talked about this morning. You're w working with some yahoos, and, you know, they irritate the living daylights out of you day and night and day and night, and even when you're not there at work, they're still aggravating you. That wait and see period of, of that job that you're in, waiting's hard. It's tough, isn't it? It's not easy. But we looked at the scripture that God promises some mind-blowing results. We looked at Isaiah 64, 4, says, For since the world began... No ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for him. Our God works for us. He's working for us. He has our future in his hands. And then we looked at Ephesians 3 that he's going to do. God can do anything far, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. We're going to look at that today, how God works within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. You know, as we wait, we need to find that peace that only God can give in our hope during that pause. Remember, we looked at David. God told the prophet Samuel there was a king over Israel. His name was King Saul, and he, God was displeased with him. He wasn't doing right, and God told the prophet Samuel, he said, I want you to go down to Jesse's house, and Jesse has eight sons, and I want to anoint one of them to be the future king. So he went out to the field, and you know, Jesse was a, a farmer, tended sheep and goats. All, so he lined up all, all his boys, all seven of his boys, except for the youngest one. He was out tending the goats and the sheep, and... Um, 
Samuel went through each one, and, Sam, and God said, no, not him. And finally, at the end, he said to Jesse, do you have any more sons? He's like, well, I've got David. He's out there in the pasture. He's out there, you know, in the field watching the sheep. He said, bring him in. Sure enough, that was the one that God anointed. God anointed David, and he said, you're going to be the future king of Israel. Um, Historians say that David could have been anywhere from the age of 10 to 15 when he was anointed king. That's pretty, something pretty heavy for a young adolescent, isn't it, that, at that age? But he had that in his heart. You know what? So he got anointed to be king. Where did David go? He went back to the pastures. He went back to the field. Historians tell us that it was a 20-year wait before it actually happened. David didn't ask to be king. He didn't dream of it, but God chose him. Some of you, maybe that dream that you have in your heart, you didn't ask for it. You didn't plan it, but God gave it to you. And David's wait wasn't easy. It took time. It took that 20 years. But he pushed through those difficulties by what, doing what he knew to do, tending the sheep, watching out for him, making sure the predators didn't get to him, and serving faithfully and obeying God patiently, waiting well, Push us through the pause by doing what we know to do. When you're in that waiting season, when you're in that pause season, do what you know to do and do it well. Do it faithfully. Do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Because the wait in Isaiah 64 so was the word kaka, meant to tarry for him, to act on our behalf. Remember we talked about it last week, that the, that waiting wasn't just kind of like a, Oh, hurry up, you know, come on, how, how much time is this? This is taking a little while, God. But waiting, that position of waiting upon God was like, um, remember I used the illustration of being in a very fine class restaurant where you have waiters, you have servers there that are there for your every movement. They're, they're waiting for their next command. They're waiting for the next thing to help you, whether it's to, you know, wipe off your ice in your, in your glass, or off, off your ice water glass, whatever it is, they're there, they're waiting, and that's what God wants us to do. So David was in the fields when Samuel came to him, looking for him to be the next king. He was simply doing his job, watching the sheep, watching the goats, but he was being faithful in the small things, obeying his father. And that anointing of him being king you know, there was no big parade, there was no big inauguration, igno there was no s celebration. It happened in private. And you know what? God's going to do the work in us in private. It's going to be when we're in our quiet times. God does most of his work in us in that private. David was a man. God meets us in the pastures of life with a desire to cultivate a heart like his. We're going to look today about how that we can cultivate our heart during that waiting season so that we can have a heart like God's. The Bible, all through the Bible, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. Don't you want that to be the description when, when someone thinks of you, man, they've got a heart just like God's. They just remind me of God. He developed that in the pasture, taking care of the sheep, watching out for the goats. That pasture, that field was David's training ground. You know, he was able to defeat Goliath. Remember David and Goliath? He was able to defeat Goliath because he was out there not just doing nothing, waiting on, on the fulfillment of his promise that he was going to be king, thinking, all right, what do I need to be doing? I need to be thinking how I want to design the palace, what, you know, what kind of swords I need to do. He's not thinking. He's thinking about the sheep, the sheep and the goat. That they, the, When the lions and the bears come to attack the young lambs, David was out there in his training ground, and he was working. He was doing what he needed to do to fight off those enemies. There was a, a scripture, I don't have it up here now, but, you know, when, when David went to go fight Goliath, because he was, you know, Goliath was out, you know, for days just making fun of the, of the, the Israelites, saying, you know, well, you say you serve God, and, and so, and nobody would go out. They were terrified. But David said, he said, hey, why is he making fun of God, making fun of God's people? You know, I'll go fight him. And they're like, what, what experience do you have? What training do you have? You have, you're nothing. You're just a young kid from the field, from the pasture. But in, in a, he's, his reply was, when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, 
I go after it with a club. I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this both to lions and bears, and I'll do this to the pagan Philistine too. I'm telling you what, David was working. He was training out there in that pause, in that pasture, wasn't he? He took his club. He had what was in his hand, and he fought off the enemies. God was training him, even in that little stuff. When there's people that annoy the heck out of you, and you're just like, okay, God, in what way can, what can I do for him? How can I bring love to that person? How can I show myself friendly to them? You're working that club. You know, you might you feel like beating them, but God, God said, you know, use what you have. What do you have right now? When, you're, and when it comes to finances or to your marriage or whatever it is, do what you've got and work. Do with what God has given you and train because God is preparing you for that. David's attitude was, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. You know, but so many times we get in a hurry and during that pause, during that waiting time in our pasture, when we want, we, we don't want to wait. We just want to experience it. We want to experience his word. We want to hurry to the finish line, but we need to stay put. How are we going to do that? How do we just stay put out there in the pasture? By doing what we know to do and responding to our father with obedience. Wherever God's placed you, whatever hard, sticky situation you're in, God created me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit. God, I want to react. I want to respond like you would respond. Pastor Rich talks about a, a time, um, and he shared this before. So when he was in, in Bible college, he got a job at a psychiatric treatment center for adolescents. He was a caseworker. And it's called Shadow Mountain Institute. He had already been working there um, quite a while before I, had, I met him because we met second year of Bible college. But anyway, he was there, to, and, and basically he had, he had a certain amount of young boys that, he was, um, that they were in there. It was a, a lock, locked place to treat them for their, their problems. And he had to write reports on them. You know, he interacted with them, different things like that. But it just kind of, you know, he was just there just pretty much, you know, <coughs> pardon me, watching the guys. So it came up for his review time, and they gave the, his uh, advisor, gave him a review, and it was not a good shining review. He's like, your reports aren't put in on time. It seems like you're just doing what, you know, just the least amount of time. Uh, you know, it was, it was not a good review. <coughs> and Rich, you know, thanked him and said, I, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. He said, and he, he could have just been skating by through, you know, Bible college, because it's just a part-time job. It's nothing, it's not anything that he wants to do a career in. But he said, I recognized when I got that review, not only was it bad for me as a representation, uh, you know, as an individual, but this is reflecting on me as a, as a Christ follower. They knew that I was going to Bible college, but it was a bad, as a bad representation of being a, a Christian. He said, so I knew that I needed to change. So he changed it. He, he you know, put his 100% into what he's doing, even though this is not a lifetime goal. But yet he was being present in the present. He was doing the best that he could do right there in the situation. I know this isn't my ultimate goal, God, where you've placed me, but I'm going to do the very best. And then the next time he came up for a review, the, his, his uh, superior was amazed at the turnaround that he had done. He said, not only have you, you turn, you've turned around, he said, but we're going to give you a promotion and give you a raise too. I'm telling you what, do what you're called to do right there in the, the moment. It may be that you're, you know, just, uh, just making time, whatever it is. Maybe it's your spouse. You're waiting for your spouse to look. Well, if they, as soon as they get their act together, then I'll, you know, as soon as they start walking in love, then I'll walk in love. No, you be the best spouse. You'll be the best partner. You'll be the best person in your friendship relationship that you are to be. Be a shining example of, of Christ's follower. Go above and beyond in your relationships. Don't wait for the other person, but go above and beyond. Maybe it's in uh, that you're standing for healing in your body. Stand on God's word. Speak God's word out of your mouth. But you know what? There are other things that you can do 
when related to your health. You can eat a well-balanced diet. You can exercise. You can get plenty of rest. Because I'm telling you, it makes a difference in your health when you eat right. It's not a, a, a fun thing to hear. But I work hard at every day. I, ha- I, would lo- I love sugar. I love fried foods. I love stuff like that. But you know what? When I discipline my body and I cut those things out of, in fact, I lost um, some weight because I was having a lot of knee problems. You know, I think there's, you know, obviously things that run down in your history and in your, in your uh, bloodline. So I was having a lot of knee pr- problems. Well, I, I, I changed my diet. I started exercise and started strengthening those muscles around there. And I'm telling you what, my knees are so much better. They're still, they're still not 20-year-old knees. And they probably won't be because I'm not 20 years old. But I'm telling you, it makes a difference what you put into your body, how you, uh, what you do with it, because our bodies are the temple of God. And if you're believing God for a health, healthy situation, but you're carrying around too, too much weight, it's going to affect your heart. It's going to affect your blood pressure. It's going to affect your bones. I'm telling you, do what you need to do, even if it's just starting small. Just start small. Maybe it's in your finances that you're believing God for a huge miracle. Start small. Are you, ki- are you giving? Are you a tither? God, I don't have a lot, but I'm going to obey you and put you first and be a tither because I need a miracle in my finances. If we're not faithful in the little things, how do we expect God to bless us? To live and don't live above your means. If you've got, you're on a budget and you like see something that you want, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm on a budget. Do what you know to do. Maybe you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad. And you're like, I don't, you know, I'm just surrounded by toddlers and kids and teenagers and whatever it is. Be the best dad. Be the best mom that you can be. Invest in your kids. That, That doesn't mean you have to take them to Disney World or anything like that, but be present for them. It's hard when your kids are screaming and crying and doing all to be present, but you just want to, you know, scream and, and tear their hair out. I know, I've been there, still there. Ask Riley, yesterday I was not very pleasant to her. <laughs> but you know what? She said, Mom, she said, Mom, you, I can't remember, I lost my train of thought. We'll come back to that. But I remember being, being, you know, the kids would say, Mom, come play with me. And I'm a real task-oriented person. I like, if I got a cleaning list or whatever it is, I want to f- finish that. Okay, I will as soon as I finish folding the clothes or whatever. But you got to be present. You know, I know, my ki- 17 years old, she, she wanted me to play baby dolls. So I had, God had to remind me, hey, sit down and play baby dolls with her because there's going to be a time when she's driving, she's out with her friends, where, you know, not that she doesn't like to spend time with us, but kids grow and their interests change. So be present wherever your children are. Waiting in the pasture and tending sheep can oftentimes seem difficult when we feel God has called us to something different. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. Know that under pressure your faith Life is forced into open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you may become mature, well-developed, and not deficient in any way. Our pasture experience will mature and develop us for the next season that's to come. Paul the Apostle, we're going to look at him If you want to turn to Acts 16, if you're looking on your phones or anything like that, or in your Bible. Paul, an apostle, he was on his second missionary journey, was headed to Philippi. But he was there in the town, and he he reminds us, he gives us a scripture that we're going to look at in just a minute, of what to do during that waiting time, of, of being present in the present. And Paul and Silas, they were, it said that they were going to a place of prayer every day, and, you know, the, as their daily habit. And there was this young slave girl who was a fortune teller who made her masters a lot of money. It was a very lucrative business. 
And this, this um, little slave girl, she came and she started following Paul and Silas whenever, you know, they're going back and forth to prayer and taunting them, making fun of them and saying, oh, these are the men of the Most High God. You know, you, they're going to tell you about Jesus. And just on and on and on, day after day, it said, when finally Paul turned to, a, turned to this slave girl and he, and he commanded that evil spirit to come out of her. And, when he, and it did. And she was set free, and she was happy about it. But the ma- her masters were furious about it because it was a lucrative business. He, she would tell people's fortune and make them a lot of money. So they were furious. So they brought him up before the magistrates, and, and the crowd got angry, got mobbed, and, and they were furious about Paul and Silas. And so it says that they took him, and they beat him. And we're going to catch up here in Acts 16, verse 23. Since they were severely beaten, and when they were thrown into prison, the jailer ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prisoners were shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open, and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, Stop! Don't kill yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them, washed their wounds, and then he and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into the house and set a meal before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Paul and Silas were doing exactly what God told them to do. They were doing exactly. They were preaching the gospel, they were going to prayer, they were doing what God told them to do. And here they ended up beaten, in prison, in stocks, but they're doing God's will. You know, in 1 Peter 4, 12, it's not up here, but it says, Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you were in the very thick of what Christ experienced For this is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. You ever found yourself doing what God told you to do, just walking in love, being kind, and you get persecuted, or just bad stuff begins to happen? And you say, God, what's going on? I'm doing your word, I'm praying, I'm seeking you, I'm doing it all. The Bible says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. That's just, it just happens. That's life. But stay true to what you are and know. You know, Paul and Silas, in their darkest hour, they sang praises to God. They shared Christ, with Christ with all. And, but in spite of this ma- wonderful miracle that happened in prison and they were released and people came to the Lord, in spite of that, the church was afraid. They were afraid. They said, you know, I'm afraid of, of what they're, if they do that to you, what are they going to do to us uh, that follow the, te- the teachings? So Paul wrote them a letter. Turn to Philippians 2.12. He wrote them a letter to Philippi, and they said, he said, hey, listen, continue doing what you're doing. Keep encouraging, keep instructing. And the, the people, the church, they did. They supported Paul's missionary journeys by financially. They showed compassion to the poor. They tended the sheep doing what they knew to do. So Philippians 2.12, Paul says to the church at Philippi, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to work out your salvation. It didn't say work for your salvation, because we know that salvation is a gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But it says here to work out your salvation, your salvation being a Christ follower. Paul encouraged the church. He said, 
Keep caring for the poor. Keep doing good. Keep nursing the sick. Keep staying true to what you know to do. Keep being there, present. We have to stay in our pasture knowing what we need to do. The Greek word there for fear and trembling in Philippians is tromos. The definition of that is the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability to meet all the requirements but faithfully does his best to fulfill his duty. Anxiety just basically means it's your desire um, to do something, but you're just, you you know, you're filled with such uh, desire to do it, but yet you want to do it right. You don't want to do it unfulfilled. You don't want to do it incomplete. And Paul's encouraging him. He's saying, trust God and obey God no matter what. When you're in there, work out your, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation. In other words, God, I'm doing what I can, I'm doing right now. God, without you, I'm not going to be able to succeed. I can't do it without your help, God. I need you. I need you to work. That's what Paul was saying. He's saying, rely totally on God. Put your trust totally in him. Think about Paul back there in the jail. What were they doing when they're waiting? They're waiting there in the jail, all beaten, and their wounds and everything, the Bible said that they were praising God and singing hymns and that the prisoners were listening. What are you doing in that situation where it seems like you've been beaten up and you can't go on any further? The Bible says that Paul and Silas began to sing praises to God. Not for their circumstances. God, I praise you for this, this, these uh, cuts on my... No, not for it, but in the circumstances. God, it doesn't matter what's happening, what's going on. I am going to worship you. I am going to lift my hands as an act of obedience to you, God, and I'm going to give you praise because, God, you know what? You're faithful. You've done so many things for me in the past. I remember, God, when I was hungry and you brought someone to, to feed me. God, I remember when I was sick And your healing power of God was working. God, I praise you in this circumstance. God, I thank you that you are faithful. God, you never, never go back on your word, but you are faithful. Paul and Silas remembered the faithfulness of God when they were in their backs were beaten and they were in chains. And you know what? The prisoners heard them. It says the prisoners were listening. What are other people when you're in that situation, when you're in that field or that pasture or in chains, what are other people hearing from your life? It says the prisoners were listening. They heard them sing praises to God. What do you sound like when it's just you and the sheep and the goat out in the pasture? Can you imagine David? One of the fun things to, to, I don't know if any of you have been on a farm. I was raised on a dairy farm. Animals do not smell good. I'm sorry. They stink. And they're messy. But, I mean, you imagine David out there in the field. Oh, God, it's so hot out here. How long do I have to be out there with these stinky sheep and these goats? They don't ever listen to me. The goats, you know, they got their own mind. And the, the sheep, they're out doing this. And I have to go chase after them. And then it's cold and windy and rainy. This is so miserable out here, God. Hurry up, God. I'm supposed to be king, and I'm out here with these stinky, messy sheep. What did David do in the pasture? He trained. Whatever came across his way, he was ready for it. It said that David played a harp, and he sang praises. A lot of the psalms are written out there. In the, sure, there was times where he expressed his, his sorrow, he expressed his grief, his disappointment. And it's okay to express your grief and your disappointment to God. God's got big shoulders. He can handle it. But you know what? You don't stay there. You don't stay there. You get above. David played that harp, and he went, oftentimes he pour out his heart and his soul of his sorrows and his frustrations. But he said, but God, you are faithful. I know that you have your word and that you, your, what you said in your word, you will fulfill that. God, I believe you. What are the other people? He played his harp so much that when Saul, he, he said that he was troubled and couldn't sleep and, and, you know, spent nights awake. And they said, I need someone to help soothe me. And they're like, hey, we know of, of a young guy 
who plays his harp out in the pasture, out in the field. How did they know that? Because out there in the pasture, people heard him singing praises. They called him in, and he played for Saul, and the evil spirits were gone just as he was playing his harp like he did out there in the pasture. What are you doing out there in the pasture? What are you sounding like to other people? What do you sound like to your family? You know, we can put on a great show at work. We can put on a great show at, 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 at um, church or anywhere else. But what do you sound like to your family members? I, ha- I had to practice this yesterday. What I was going to say yesterday, I was um, mopping the floor, and, and Riley was asking me questions and a bunch of stuff, and, and, I, and I was just snapping back at her. She's like, Mom, you sound like you're mad. I'm like, I'm, I just hate mop, and I just don't like to mop. I was taking that out and taking it out on her, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, you know, here she goes. Well, you, you know, you kind of, you kind of get onto me when I act like that. I'm like, so just keep on mopping. You know? <laughs> I don't want to hear that right now from my 17 year old, but it was the spirit of God. What do I sound like in my pasture? What do I sound like in my to my family? Am I an example of Christ? I wasn't. I had to go back and apologize, ask God, you know, you know, I'm, you know, I didn't feel better about, I mean, I did it in obedience because I knew it was right. I didn't feel like asking him, her for an apology. I didn't feel like it. I, I wasn't in the mood. Here I am supposed to be praying and seeking God and preaching on Sunday. But I'm in the pasture, stinking it up with the sheep, having a bad attitude. What does it what do you sound like in the pasture? Are you letting God train you? Are you letting God have a heart that was after his? My heart wasn't my heart was right, but my attitude wasn't the same and wasn't lining up. You know, sometimes it just takes a little adjustment to make those adjustments and just keep on going. Keep on going. You know, David tended his family sheep. And he fought off and killed wild an- animals. He played his harp. He even, you know, lived in caves further on down. He lived in caves and he ran from his enemy, Saul. I mean, Saul, yeah, the same boy that was playing for him, he was throwing spears at him and David had to dodge and, and duck and run off into the mountains, into the caves. Saul, Saul had threatened his life. You know, as David waited... King Saul repeatedly tried to deter him from becoming king. David was discouraged. He was down and he felt defeated. Let's look at Psalms 56 as we come to a close. Oh God, have mercy on me. People are hounding me. My foes attack me all day long. I am constantly hounded by those who slander me and are boldly attacking me. But when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? They are always twisting what I say. They spend their days plotting to harm me. They come to spy on me, watching my every step, eager to kill me. Don't let them get away with their wickedness in your anger, O God. Bring them down. You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Praise slays defeat. Praise slays defeat. Singing praises to God can lift the head of a destitute man. It can comfort the heart of someone who's broken. It can encourage the wayward child. Maybe you've got a wayward child or wayward someone in your Begin to praise. Begin to praise him for who he is and for what he has done and for what he's going to do. Praise will defeat an enemy. Verse 9, my enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. This I know, God is on my side. I praise God for what he has promised. See, David, he's discouraged, he's down, but he's, he's going back. He's like, okay, I'm, not, I, I'm down, I'm discouraged, but I'm not going to stay there. I'm praising you, God, for what you have promised. Yes, I praise the Lord for what he has promised. I trust in God. So why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Waiting on God isn't wasting time. It's training time. Whether we're tending sheep in the pasture, 
facing Goliath or hiding in a cave, we've got to have our weapons. What are our weapons? Our weapons are spending time in God's word, praying and praising. Truth is one of the most powerful weapons that we have. His word is truth. You know, the enemy will taunt you and, and get at you with lies. He says, you know, God doesn't really have a plan for you. you you're not really going to become successful. Your dream is never going to happen. You're going to be stuck here. You're stuck here. But prayer slays the giant of I want to quit. Double down and go into prayer. You know, the long wait causes us to say, yeah, Lord, just forget about it. I, this is too hard. I, I, I'm giving up. I'm finished. I'm out. That's when we have to double down and use the training that we've learned during that wait. Because quitting is not an option. Verse 12 says, I will fulfill my vows to you, O God, and we will offer thanks of your help. For you have rescued me from death, and you have kept my feet from slipping. So now I walk in your presence, O God, your life giving light god met david in the pastures of bethlehem to train him to become like him as we wait on god he begins to soften our hearts so that it resembles his heart god work in me god what are you trying to teach me what are you trying to train me for i'm telling you if you if you listen to god and you hear god and you and, and you obey it, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it's hard, it's difficult, you'll look back and you say, man, that difficult season that I was in, this is what I learned. And, that, and now I'm stronger. He strengthened me for this greater trial, for this greater enemy. David was determined to keep his heart close to God and to trust him. I want to finish with this scripture, Proverbs 3. It's a real familiar passage of scripture. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust God, this is from the message, from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one that will keep you on track. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. You may not understand it. You may be discouraged and ready to quit, but you know what? God wants to teach you. He wants to trust. He wants you to trust him in the pasture. It may be stinking it up in that pasture with those sheeps and those goats that you're working with or that you're married to or that you have, you know, your kids. Whatever it may be, it might be a stinky mess, but you know what? You trust God. Don't try to figure it out on your own, but God, I give it to you. Let's stand. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're faithful. You're always on time. You're never late. God, we say today that we trust you. We trust you to train us in the pasture, in the field, in that wait, waiting time that's hard, that's difficult. God, I ask that you strengthen and encourage the people to hear that their hearts are discouraged. They're downtrodden. God, that it's hard to even lift up their head to say, God, help me. God, I thank you that you surround them with your love, with your comfort, with your peace, and that you can lift their head so they can look to you because that's where their help comes from. And God, we lift our head right now. We lift our hearts. We lift our hands and we say, God, I surrender. Work in me. Forgive me, God, for having an attitude, for having a sound that stinks toward your nostrils. God, forgive me. God, I apologize and I'm going to do better. I'm going to do whatever I need to do right here in this moment, in this place. Because, God, I know you've got my future in your hands, and you are faithful to perform it. We thank you for that.